All right. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah. So, as uh, so, following on from sort of what Dom has been talking about, um, the things I've been working on for the last couple of months is, have been uh, looking at uh, one of our new um, uh, aeromagnetic and radiometric surveys we flew, um, and trying to think about how can we add value to that. Um, yeah. So, first of all, um, so just to sort of. Uh, make sure everyone's sort of up to date with the sort of the, the general uh, um, the history of it. So the previous state, what we've sort of all been used to is, uh, is typically this sort of open range, 400 meter space data. Um, we've also got uh, your, your 100,000 uh, detailed geology and, um, and structural uh, layers, which, uh, which the GSQ have, um, as you can see there on the right. Um, and, uh, and when you look at the at overlaying the structures, so I've just in the middle one here, you can see the faults um, that are part of the GSQ detailed structure um, overlaying on top of the, the mag. I should say the mag there is uh, RTP with the, with one, the first vertical derivative uh, in grayscale. So, so you're seeing a bit of the, the, the grain in there. Um, but you can really, you, first thing you can really pick out is that uh, is a number of sort of pretty, pretty obvious um, sort of trends. You've got your northeast <coughs> trend, uh, your northwest, and then you've got a couple of things which are north-south in there. Um, and really, everyone can see that in Google Earth. They're the, the most salient features, these late Eisen um, features. But the previous mapping has really emphasized these things that are quite easy to see, and that's because the, the data wasn't of a resolution that can, can really get past that. And, and so this is a really great data set to inherit. It's a great place to start. But it doesn't convey a huge amount of information on the, on the structure of the belt or the style of deformation that you might expect to see. <coughs> What, what, our, what our maps tend to be very good at are uh, these, these large scale structures and knowing which rocks you'll find in which areas. Um, and so now that uh, the, the one thing that this, the, as a structural geologist, these maps typically lack is this north south structural grain we see pretty much everywhere, especially in the eastern succession, uh, you know, related to the D2 of the eyes and orogeny. And while we can see that reflected in some of the um, you can see that reflected in some of the um, uh, all the stratigraphy and the elongation in the in the, the Wonga um, Wonga belt through there. Um, we don't actually see any structures, so um, so the next step is to start to sort of uh, leverage some of this new data and uh, and try and see what what else we can find. So. We've gone from a big step uh, big step change down from 400 meter spacing to 100 meter spaced regional, regional surveys. So we're really starting to get these sort of detailed surveys flown really clo close to the ground. Um, and you can see a lot of the structural complexity. Um, so it's a great, great pre-competitive data set for explorers to use, but it's also something that we can, we can leverage and value add to. <coughs> and as the search space moves deeper and deeper, um, you know, it's, it's explorationists are using new tools to test the potential, um, mineral potential at depth. And these are also going to rely on, on up, updates to the solar geology, which is really uh, the better, we need a better solar geology to, um, that's constrained by multiple geophysical methods to really understand what is the depth of cover and what are the rock types of, uh, at, in the basement. And also, especially with the structural uh, host and sort of settings in a lot of the eastern, eastern fold belt um, ore deposits, we really need to understand what's the structural style in the basement as well. So the concept is that uh, we, if we first can understand some of the, uh, uh, the style and, and the deformation and the structure in the more well exposed parts of the inlier, and then we can, use that, we can leverage that and, ex and use that information to apply it to more under to undercover parts of the belt or looking at the same structural domains along strike where they go undercover. <coughs> And GSQ is in a really good position to be able to do something like this because we can work, in, traditionally we've worked in a very regional sort of space and explorationists are working very sort of locally at the sort of camp or prospect scale. And we're sort of in a good position to be able to bridge those two um, and, and try and sort of look at the sort of scales that some of these mineral systems are going to be operating on. Um, <coughs> I should, I should mention actually with this, uh, this the, just might, flick, might just flick back between the last slide. If you can just pay, take, put your attention to this, this uh, the coarse sort of um, in coarseness in that sort of early data set, and you can really start to see 
um, a huge amount of refined detail. And I'll take you through some of the areas a bit later um, where we can really see some big improvements. <coughs> so first of all, um, yeah, so as a, a solid geology project, uh, basically just to outline the workflow uh, and, and the data sets that we're going to be using. Um, so obviously there's the, the aeromagnetic survey, uh, which you can see there on the left. Um, that we've also got some beautiful uh, radiometric data which comes through with that. Um, and some of the, we, there's uh, some of these, uh, the middle side here is, is showing some uh, a product of the, the version two high map data, which we flew over a number of these um, structural corridors. So uh, that's really good to looking at alteration. Um, and then obviously we've got this, the, the ground, the, the surface and solid geology, and also point data that we've collected uh, through years of transects and uh, mineral occurrences and things like that. So, uh, the, the, so it starts out as a desktop study, and we can use use these data sets to create a structural skeleton, from which we can then uh, make a preliminary solid geology interp. Um, I've actually just came back from the field a couple of weeks ago, um, doing a bit of a, a ground validation campaign, and I'm in the process of working uh, this into the into the um, into the model and going through to a final interp. <coughs> so. Dom talked about uh, the Mary Kathleen domain as a whole, um, both uh, in the far south, down in the Duchess sort of areas, and all the way up through into the Bamara, um, the Bamara um, Horst. I'm, I'm focused really on this little part of the Mary Kay domain uh, in between the Mount Remarkable Fault up through here and uh, the Fountain Range Quamby Fault zone through there. And so what you can see in this map uh, in the oranges and greens in the west, <coughs> this is uh, your Calcutin and Leichhardt suite. So the, the edge of the Mary Kathleen domain essentially is, is near the edge of this sort of map here. And then in green, in our pinks here, you've got the Wonga Batholith, and then the blues are the, is the Sea of Corella formation that, uh, that this intrudes. Um, so yeah, zooming in onto, that, onto this, uh, this area in the middle here, um, and this is the area that, uh, that I've been focusing most of my work on, uh, surrounding this, uh, this feature, the Landsberg Graben, which is this, this sort of uh, zone of uh, really <coughs> low uh, magnetic response. Um, So before I go, sorry, I should uh, should mention that um, it, a lot of the uh, a lot of the the detail, the structure that comes out of this this high high resolution, and, and I, I understand you can't wouldn't really be able to see much in uh, in the magnetics here, but really is, is quite sort of spectacular, and we rec recognise that a lot of these corridors uh, are quite high strain zones. There's, there's not a lot of a lot of really uh, modified stratigraphic context. There's not a lot of sort of simple um, uh, contact relationships through there. <coughs> so Mount Godkin is one of these areas. It's, it's really quite interesting. Um, Dom, Dom talked to you a little bit about it. Uh, it's part of the, the Wonga uh, Burstal uh, su suites. And some of the things that we found that were uh, uh, stra uh, straight away is that uh, uh, the, Wong the Wonga, sorry, the Mount Godkin uh, granite is mapped as an undivided uh, unit. But if you look at the second image uh, in through here, you can actually, so what, what we've got here is the magnetics in the background and then the geology overlaying on top of that. And you can actually see quite a bit of, uh, of different um, differences there. You can see the radiometrics on the right uh, for, for reference. And all of these are uh, these light pink and light green zones are all mapped as a homogeneous unit. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference in there. <coughs> and in the magnetic image, you can see there's quite a lot of, uh, of high magnetic intensity, uh, short wavelength features. So there's quite a lot of structure. Um, some of the interesting things we found is that the, the Cameron Fault, which is a, one of these, these northeast striking faults that runs through, uh, through to the south of Mount Godkin, was initially uh, interpreted to run all the way through the north uh, and, and wrap around uh, the granite there. But we can actually see uh, that it's actually truncated by uh, one of these unnamed faults, uh, which I'm just calling the East Godkin Fault at the moment. Um, <coughs> In the, uh, in the east as well, there's a, this zone of sort of quite diffuse radiometric um, response. And we, when we did a foot transect in through there, we realized that there's quite a lot of fairly late brittle to semi-brittle de um, deformation associated with really texturally destructive like bleaching alteration. Um, so and this is a common theme that we found um, both from the desktop study and in the field, this early ductile, you know, Eisen D2 uh, that's overprinted by a brittle ductile um, sort of usually sort of strikes loop shear sort of related deformation. 
There's also a very, this uh, extremely high magnetic feature that you can see here is a bit of a strange one because uh, it's, it's pro probably uh, one of the highest magnetic uh, anomalies in the entire survey. Um, but in this RTP image, there's actually, it actually still uh, comes out as a subtle dipole. So we think there might be some remnants there. And what's even stranger is that the rocks at the surface uh, are actually just a pretty standard corella formation. And they're essentially identical to the rocks immediately to the south here in this sort of more blue color. So there's probably must be, might be something in the subsurface there um, <coughs> to, to explain that, that magnetization. We also made some pretty good observations of the, of the intrusive contacts um, of the, the, the Mount Godkin granite. Um, so there's previous studies who, who call it a, a sill-like body, and we definitely saw that's the case um, in, the <coughs> uh, in the field. Um, initially, we thought maybe there was, with all of this, uh, this sort of uh, shape and structure, it seems like maybe there's a bit of structure in the shape of that granite, but I think what we're actually looking at, or we realize that is we're actually looking at the effect of a shallowly dipping body and uh, interacting with topography there. Um, <coughs> so on, on our transect up through here and, and around where you can see number four, um, yeah, we, we walked up through a, a remarkably unrecrystallized sequence of corella formation. So this is something which I hadn't seen throughout most of the belt. It's usually extremely deformed and recrystallized. Um, and we've got, you know, preserving really nice um, uh, sedimentary structures. So we've got uh, here's a sample of uh, of, of Hornfels meta sediments uh, up in, in that transect, uh, with really fine uh, you know, centimetre sort of scale cross bedding, and it's all uh, it's all still right, right way up, which is um, which is nice to sort of see. You don't typically see uh, way up indicators too well in this like, part of the world. Um, and we saw when we saw these meta sediments uh, within the calc silicate sequence, we often could find them as little pendants or enclaves within the granite as well. So it definitely seems to be a sort of fairly complex sort of um, geometry. Um, there's also some of these strange things, and I'll farm it out to anyone. If anyone knows what the heck these things are, please come and talk to me. <laughs> we are uh, the strata bound uh, layers of these uh, strange nodular um, to sort of amoeboid shapes. And at first, I I really had no idea uh, what we're looking at, but my current working hypothesis is that we're looking at some sort of a weird Scarni effect um, during the intrusion. Um, and you've got sort of, you know, it, it's constrained a certain layer, so perhaps something uh, along um, some of these, um, uh, these beds. We also saw a couple of uh, indications locally of, uh, of deformed um, bedding uh, being cut by dikes. So these are two photos, and, you can, and just sketched on top of them uh, in black is the trace of bedding. So here's a, a very small sort of scale fold um, with its hinge plunging sort of uh, moderately to the south, which is the same as what the, the overall bedding is doing, and that's cut by a granite dike here. <coughs> and the image on the right, you can also see uh, bedding that's, uh, that's folded in here, uh, highlighted in black, um, cut by a couple of dikes which are coming straight out of the, um, the Godkin granite. So the issue is we, we definitely see there's some deformation either before or during intrusion, but we need to try and figure out what that means. <coughs> Uh, zipping over uh, to the northwest um, at the margin of the Wonga Belt. Um, uh, so I've just uh, zoomed in on the geology uh, in here on the right. And this is the, the GSQ's um, sort of current geology. Uh, the interpretation is pretty much just sort of, you know, um, uh, concordance stratigraphy striking sort of more or less north-south uh, with the, the Corella Formation in the west uh, uh, going down through the Lion Creek Basalt and the lower uh, Corella Formation units in the east. Um, but then... If you look at this, uh, this image with the geology overlaying on the magnetics, you can see there's quite a lot going on, particularly in this area here around two, where there's, there's quite a lot of, uh, of truncation and a lot of, uh, of folding. So we recognize with this new data set, this is actually quite a high strain zone. Um, and the, the ductal character of deformation tells us that it's most likely associated with the, the earlier phases of the Eisen, so Eisen D2. And we can trace this zone uh, all the way to the, to the far north and, uh, and even in the, the more undercover areas north of the, um, of the Mount Rock Michael Fault. And it goes all the way further south around uh, Mount Godkin and Burstall uh, into the Fountain Range Fault. So it's quite a substantial sort of um, structure. Um, in the, you also see that uh, in the image on the, on the right there, the, this is a magnetic image with the, my, my interpretation overlaying on it. And you see there's quite a lot of, uh, of um, reactivation and splays off this. 
<coughs> in, in the system, which are probably related to the late Eisen. But the most easternmost of these, uh, up here in the top right corner, is the northern continuation of a fault called the Pinnacle Fault, which uh, likely acted as a growth fault in the Jurassic. We can see the strata thickening towards the west. But uh, then we also see the same, um, the same Jurassic rocks. They're also cut by uh, one of the strands of this fault. Um, and so here is uh, further to the south of, uh, of the map that you see here. But uh, this is where the Pinnacle Fault intersects with one of these uh, mesas of Jurassic <coughs> rock. And there's a big uh, five meter thick, bre thick breccia zone in through there. So we're probably looking at sort of maybe tens to hundreds of meters of, of, um, of displacement on some of these, of reactivation on, uh, on some of these faults. Um, and I expect that that would be the case on a lot of these ones. It's just here we have Jurassic rocks to tell us it's actually really young. Um, another little area that, uh, that's, that's quite sort of interesting, and this has been one of the areas that's spent, uh, spent quite a lot of time thinking about, um, is, is over near the Roseby Schist. So, um, so yeah, Corey, you recognize this over at, um, you know, we're looking essentially at Dougald River, which sits right into uh, the eastern side of the Snapdell Quartzite in here. Uh, and also we've got uh, Little Eva in the northern part here. So there's quite a bit of, uh, of economic potential through there. And the, the lithologies are, it's essentially a schist belt um, with the, the Mount Roseby schist, which is equivalent to the, uh, the Mount Albert group. Um, so, so this sort of younger package of sediments. And that hosts this uh, Roseby style um, you know, copper. Um, there's, a, there's, there's, great, um, there's great company mapping through the area as well. So this is one of the reasons why it's a great place to, to spend a lot of time. Um, so we can use this to, to um, integrate with it. Um, so essentially, uh, we've going from one, one, two, and three, we go from the Duga River sequence, where we've got a couple of fault-bound packages, and then into the foot wall further towards the east. Um, a number of sort of schist, variably sort of uh, deformed sort of um, slices of, uh, of Mount Albert group and possibly also Corella formation. Going even further to, Mount, uh, to, the, to the east into the Mount Roseby fault at number three, um, and it, we think it's, it's probably a, it's a sort of vertical fault, sort of with quite a lot of, uh, of splays that sort of come up to the northeast. These are northwest, sorry, northwest. These northwest striking ones, um, they actually are, are responsible for some sort of uh, stacking of the, of the load up at Little Eva. Um, and in the south, some of the splays uh, <coughs> here contain some of the uh, um, Quambi conglomerate, which you see down there in four. Um, if you take, turn your attention to that image on the right there, it's a strange one for probably most of you, but this is some high map data. And what it's showing is the crystallinity of, of white mica. So blues and purples are more uh, kaolinitic. And the yellows and reds are more uh, more crystalline, sort of, um, uh, and and it could also be sort of chlorite as well there. So, but you see that uh, in you know we're associated with um, in Duga River. There's sort of quite high values up near a lot of this sort of Roseby faults. We've got sort of elevated sort of um, crystallinity. It tells you there's probably some high temperature fluids coming through there. This southern area is, uh, and I'll just flick back, uh, draw your attention to this. This is the same image, but. Now we're just looking at the pixels with above the median amount of um, of this of, um, uh, of, of this uh, this white mica, and we're still then color coding it between low and high crystallinity. And there's a strange actually anomaly right here, which is just north of the Quambi Gold Mine, which uh, this has sort of got me thinking a little bit at the moment. There's quite a lot of this uh, <coughs> maybe sericitic or quartz sericitic alteration through there, but this little uh, this little circle through here. Um, is is a, a zone of increased abundance and higher crystallinity, and it's just near that near that gold mine there. So, it, and it's coincident with a like a little ring shape in the magnetics as well. So, it's a strange little place. We found the Quambi gold mine again, I guess. <laughs> um, in the west, we actually got a quite a low strain zone, um, starting with the Napdal quartzite through here. Um, it's all uh, pretty homogeneously dipping to the west um, and and relatively un undeformed. Um, we think uh, going in sort of, uh, we think that there's, uh, we think it's a, a, like a, comp a lens of competent rock um, sitting in there in between um, some sort of um, more deformed sort of zones. Um, and you get quite a lot of alteration in that upper contact uh, through here uh, along uh, one of these main faults. Um, and you get sort of things like garnet storolite schists sitting in between just quartzites and then further to the west, pretty sort of, um, pretty standard. Um, Dolomitic siltstones and, uh, and dirty dollar stones. Um, there's also lenses of amphibolite in there, so we think that's sort of a pretty high strain zone. But apart from that, we only see we see pretty rare penetrative fabric all the way through this zone um, until we come to the pinnacle fault in the south, 
where we run into schists again. So this is probably sort of a, a bit more of a major structure and we've got this sort of little lens of a uh, of fairly uh, low strain rocks in there. Uh, and there's just a little field photo of, um, of some of these uh, interbedded calc silicates. And, and again, uh, we see this typical foliation um, within the, the, the ductal foliation just uh, picks up the, on the, the carbonates, uh, which are much weaker. Um, yeah. So, oh, well that was, uh, that went really fast. Right, so the take home message, I guess, um, are that, you know, the, the high res uh, data sets are a real step change um, and uh, in the data quality for explorers, and, and we're, we see this as an opportunity to add value. Um, secondly, there's a lot of structural complexity. And, and the typical story we're seeing is early ductal deformation. Uh, usually it, it's a crenulation, uh, you know, and these crenulations parallel <coughs> to your lithological layering. And then during later, uh, later rise in erogeny, this is, this is a, a <coughs> site that uh, localizes deformation, which is usually fairly brittle in the silicates and ductal in the carbonates. Um, <coughs> this is actually the same, the same story that, uh, that they see um, in Dougald River, except uh, there's uh, some sulfides, I think, that are... Um, that are being uh, that are being sort of dynamically crystallized, um, and yeah, that uh, that we're starting with this under this uh, this outcropping area, with the thought to push this forward into the more into the undercover domains further north uh, in the uh, in the Mary Kathleen domain, and and this, the learnings from this structural inter will really be applicable as we go forward. <coughs>